So when you guys first start uh, with Unity, you'll actually have a little icon here that's called uh, Unity Hub. And when you open it up, it will be have a little window like this. Uh, and if you have any current projects you are working on, they will be right here in this window. And if you don't have any ones you're working on or you need to start a new one, you'll just click New. And then it'll have you pick 2D, 3D, or any of the other templates that they have. For this one, we're going to be using 3D. Um, it'll have you name your project wherever you, whatever you want to name it. And then you'll click uh, the little dots on the right here to choose a location that you want to save it to. And then after that, you'll just hit create. I'm actually going to cancel out here because I actually have the project in my current projects. And sometimes when it's um, like loading up like this, it will have an error code and it'll say there's not a fix known for it right now. And if there's not a fix known, you just click cancel and then you kind of go back, open the Unity Hub again and just reload the project. And then the second time, usually it works. So this is the project. I'm just going to do a quick show this. Is there a way to move the Zoom thing at the top here? Never mind, I found it. Okay. Side. And then when you get into Unity, you'll have, uh, usually it'll start off with like a blank scene. Let me, uh, it's called sample scene. So you'll start off with a scene that looks like this. And what you will do is you can either use that scene or you just click, uh, right click on your little bar down here and you'll create scene and then I'll have you name the scene that you want. What do you want it to be called? And I'm going to open up the one I have right now. So what we're actually going to be creating here is pretty simple. It's a single player Pong clone. Zoom out here and with a main menu as well. So the, and then at the very top here, you'll have play, pause, or step, which is like for cinematics and all that kind of stuff. Like if you have, if you want advance forward, hit play real quick here and just show you guys what we're going to be creating. So you'll have a, like a play button right here on your title screen. Normally you'd have like a title up here and you'd have other buttons as well. But let's see, play. You have a ball that's bouncing, you have a little paddle that's moving, and then as it you bounce it back towards the box, it just um, counts your score. And then at the end, once you finally lose control of the ball, it says game over your score, and then you'll have a choice to go back to the main menu or replay the level. So let's get to how we're going to create that. I'm going to create a new scene here real quick. So I'll call this level one. And then you just click on the level or the scene there to open it up. So at the beginning, you'll just have a directional light and a main camera. And what we're going to be doing for the, so we're going to create a spear that will be, and then when you create an object, like if it's, if you can't, like if it's far away like that, you just click uh, the F key and it'll bring it up to focus on the object. And for right now, I'm just going to actually set it at zero, 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 which is where its placement in the world is going to be and have it kind of centered right here. I'm going to, you can click up here in this inspector window to 
name it. I'm going to name it ball. And then we're going to need the three walls and then the paddle. So you'll do create or right click on your hierarchy here. 3D object cube. And this one we're going to call paddle. And then you can go down here to where it says scale. And we'll make it to adjust the size of it. And we're going to make it 20 or 0.25 units wide. We're going to do two and a half units tall and 1.2 units deep. And the depth is not as important right now, but I do a little deeper just to make sure that if the ball is moving a little bit forward and backwards, which it's not supposed to do, but just in case it does, the paddle can still catch it. And then we're just going to move it off here with the move tool, which is you can either click on that or you just hit your W key when you have an object selected. And then you can just back it up this way a little bit off to the side. And then we're going to do the same thing here with the create a cube and we're going to create the three walls. So about 20 units long. You can do the other two still at one and one, or actually 1.25 on the Z, just in case. And then we're going to bring it up to about five or six, depending on which one you want to do. Have, this is just going to determine how tall you want the level to be, or how tall you want the, the box to be. So I'm going to split the difference here and do five and a half. And then you can actually click on this one here, Control D, and then just go in here and type negative 5.5 to make the bottom wall. Then we'll do Control D again. This one's actually going to be at zero. Then instead of here, we'll do one and we'll do, try to only do math real quick in my head, uh, 12 units tall to make sure that it goes top to bottom here. And then we'll position this off to the end here so that it's at the far end. And then now that we know kind of roughly how big the box is, we can adjust this one accordingly here. So now we have the basic components of the three walls, the ball, and the paddle. Now what we want to do is we want to make sure our camera is positioned where we can see the whole scene. So what we'll do is you can either select the camera here or you can select the camera right here and then it'll give you your little camera preview window and make sure that it's at zero. So it's kind of right in the middle. And it actually happens to be positioned depth wise where I want the bottom edge of the, or the top edge of the bottom wall and the bottom edge of the top wall to be just at the top and bottom of my camera here. So now that we have all that positioned, now we can start adding the scripts to make everything work. Um, did anybody have any questions or is everyone able to get things set up so far? Or have I lost anyone? I don't know about everyone else, but so far I have the wall and uh, the floor. I'm working on the roof and the paddle right now. Uh, so my guess is everyone else is roughly at around the same time, uh, at, at around the same spot. Okay. I'll give, uh, give you guys a couple minutes here to make sure everything gets placed before we move on. Um, some of the other things I was going to bring up here, I guess, throughout the, this discussion is like process for like beginning your first game. Um, like, I went to uh, game design school to get a degree in it. Um, by no means do you have to do this. There's definitely a lot of ways to get self-taught these days uh, for making your own games. Um, one of the biggest things I will say, and actually this is something I even went through a couple things to get ready for this lecture, was um, scope, which is making sure that you make your project small enough so that you're not making going for something too big. Like I actually started off my first 
game I was going to make for this lecture going to show here was a like a like a little action platformer style game and then I realized I only have an hour and a half to teach this so that's that was going to be too big uh, usually a good rule of thumb is you want to make sure like your very first few games are three to four week projects so that you can have something done and something you can show because so you don't want to get like three or four months in and then have not gone very far at all because that can be kind of demoralizing for trying to learn and all that all right now the other the thing we're actually going to do before we start doing the script here is we want to we're going to do is what you create you right click down here in the hierarchy and you're going to want to create a physics material and i actually have one here like when you click on it it'll just pop up one here and then it'll have you uh name it and for the new physics material that we're going to be using here, we're going to create, we're going to have the dynamic friction and the static friction set to zero. And the bounciness at one. All right, could you go over that again, how to create the bouncy? Okay. Um, so you do create. Um, and then you go down to where it says physics material right here. And then you'll. Um, just click on that and then it'll pop up something that's kind of got an icon like this. Okay. And then you can name it bouncy or you can name it whatever you want to name it. And then we're going to have the settings for our physics will be zero, zero, one. And then we're going to have the friction combined for average and then the bounce combo or combined set to maximum. Then once we get this created, we're going to need to make this now our new physics for the game. So you'll go to edit, project settings, and then it'll pop up a little window like that has your audio, your editors, and all these other different stuff. And for this, we're going to be using just the physics, which it's just like generic or not. It's anything that's not 2D games. And then you'll drag, like right here, normally it'll be like how this says here, it says non-physics material. And then you're going to take and drag your bouncy over top of the box here that says for default material. And when you do that, it'll recreate your, or it'll replace that physics with the one we just created. Sorry, question. Where do I find the project settings again? I'm a little bit behind. Project settings is under edit, and it's down here near the bottom. Then once you click on that, you'll just find physics, click on that, and then do the, just drag and drop that into here. Got it. All right, so now that we have physics going, or we will select the ball and you'll need to go down to here where it says add component you'll click on add component and then you'll type in rigid body or usually once you get to like rig it'll come up on the list down here and where you'll select rigid body and rigid body is like a physics thing within the game and engine itself that kind of adds like a mass and all these other things that we're actually in this one, we're not going to be using gravity because even when you don't select or have used gravity deselected, 
it is still going to add a weight to it and the normal gravity of the game itself or the world will still pull your objects down. So then, and then you can use control S at any point you want to save to make sure you're saving your progress here. Um, I usually always do control S before I do play test, just so if it crashes while I'm play testing, I have my thing saved. Then we're gonna play it. And actually at the moment, nothing is going to happen because I check because we don't have any gravity or anything, but it'll just be kind of sitting there. Now, what we're going to do here is you can create like either a folder if you want to, which I'll show you real quick, create folder and call it, and you can name it scripts, or you can just put all your scripts in this box if you want to. Normally, I always have one for my scenes, one for my scripts, so I kind of can keep things organized in my project. So for the paddle itself, when you're creating the new script, you'll just do create C sharp script. And then whenever you has you create one, it'll show the little naming thing here. I'm just gonna do just call it test. And for this one, we are actually gonna be this will be the one for the ball that we're gonna be creating next is everyone staying up so far is i'm following but i don't know about everyone else trying to let me look at chat real quick If we fall way too uh, far behind, I'm always recording this, so we can just uh, go back and uh, look at it online. Okay. Right. So whenever you, like, if you, for the ball script here, once you get the script named, um, you'll just double click on it here, and it'll open up either in the one that I've put in the lesson here. It's for Visual Studios. Uh, some people use different softwares. Uh, trying to remember what the other one is, the other common one used right now. Somebody remembers or somebody knows what the other one is, you can put it in chat here. Um, so for the ball, the ball script is pretty much just going to be sending the ball in a direction so we're going to have just one variable here at the very top it's uh, a public variable which means that you'll be able to mess with it in the inspector like you'll be able to change the settings on it if it's private which is the other kind private means you will not be able to see it in your inspector and for this one, it's going to be the type of variable that it is, is a float, which is a number that has a decimal point so that it's only, so you can have any number you want in there. And then we're going to name the variable speed. And then after everything you do in any line of code in uh, gaming or in programming, I mean, like for setting variables, writing other lines of code, you'll want to always make sure there's a semicolon afterwards. Okay, Notepad and Notepad++ also work to open the scripts. All right, that's good to know. Thanks, Q. So this one, and usually when you have this, you'll have the public class, which is just all your scripting in general, like every phase of it goes inside of your public class. Then you have usually just two functions that are named right out of the gate, which are void start and void update. And void start is 
whenever like you hit play or you start the level, the whatever it says void start, it does it right at the beginning. And if you're doing something called, if you're in void update here, void update is called every frame. So if it says, like if we were to have this down here, then every single frame, it would be basically restarting the thing. So we don't want, so for this purpose, we want to make sure we're in void start here. And we're going to create two kind of different variables here. And we're actually going to create them. Usually you want to set them up here, but for this instance, we're actually just going to create them right here. And it's going to be two float variables and it's float SX and SY. SX or the S for both of which it starts, it stands for starting for your start X direction and your start Y direction. And then you will just deal type, I'll have like where it says equals and then random dot range which means it will be picking a random number within a range that we set. And we want the numbers to be the, or the range to be set from zero to two. And then, so it's either gonna pick zero, one. And if it's, have it set up where it says if it's equal, to zero, then it changes it over to negative one. And if it's one, it stays at one. Which, so then when we do this, we're gonna have a line here that says, get component rigid body. So that means that for the object that the script is assigned to, it's gonna go onto that object find the component rigid body. So in this case, the rigid body that we just put on the ball. And then you're gonna have these open and closed uh, parentheses here, which is when every time you do a function, in this case, get component, you need to put that, those parentheses on there to call the function. And then dot velocity. So we're gonna find the component and then we're going to find the subcomponent velocity, which is go in here real quick. Click on the ball. Velocity. Velocity is basically just like a directional move force. And I cannot actually remember where. Oh, it's and so if you go under info here, it'll take this subcomponent here, velocity. And you can't actually mess with that in here. So that's uh, just showing you what the different components are. And you're gonna wanna make sure it's equal to a new vector three. Vector threes are an array of three numbers. And the for the X and then for when you're doing numbers, it's always X, Y, and then Z, like they stay in alphabetic order here. So for the X direction, and you can do this either SX first or speed first, and you're gonna do one of them times by the other. And then you'll put a comma afterwards, which means, okay, we're done with the X direction, and then we're moving on to the Y. And then we have speed times starting Y direction and then a comma, and then we can just do zero F for the Z because that would be forward and backward in the scene. And we don't want the ball coming towards the camera or going away from the camera. So we want to keep that at zero. And then again, remember, put a semicolon at the end of that. Same thing for these other two lines. And then you'll just do control S or file save. And then you can minimize the window down and whenever you go out of that back into unity after you click on the inspector here it'll take a moment to load up all the changes and then you'll select the ball and you'll grab your new script ball and drag it over and then make sure before you go in and test anything you got to make sure you set your speed variable 
So we'll start off, we'll just do five to see how that looks. And then make sure you save your scene and then hit play. And then there you go. So at the beginning, it picked in this case one and negative one directions. So it went this way to start off with. And then the other thing the rigid body does also is it makes sure that it then, like when it hit the wall here, it collides with that. Then you'll do the same thing, the right click, create C sharp script for, and then this one we will name paddle. And then you'll just open that one up the same way. And for this one, it's going to be even simpler. We have the same public float speed. In this case, it'll be separate speed. This one's for the paddle itself. Is everyone, is everyone doing okay here? on this. I got compilers. Okay, yeah, and the compilers is probably uh, that something's just like if you messed up, because even if you just mess up like one period or one letter difference, it can throw off your whole script which is actually something for me was very hard getting into coding because I'm not a very good speller. So getting into a thing where it says everything has to be spelled 100% correctly, punctuation and capitalizations are very important was uh, a challenge for me and has actually pushed me to get a lot better at trying to focus on learning how to spell correctly things. And then also I had to learn a whole new, basically coding language on top of English. So for this one, so it's the public float speed here outside of the class. And also I, get, I should note too, that if you wanted to, like you could set a speed variable, like you could set speed equals and put the number in. But if you do that, then any number you put in to your inspector will get changed to whatever this number is once you start. Um, when you start the script running, so if you're gonna only, I would, I usually only do that for like private variables that I'm not. I know I'm not going to be messing with the number on. Then. Sorry about that. Um, so in this one, we're not going to do anything in the void start um, function. The well, only line of code we're actually going to use here is going to be in our void update so that it will be re, uh, called every frame. And then it's a um, start so with transform, which transform means that you're doing um, like you're changing a variable or changing a, um, let's go back here real quick. You're changing one of the transform numbers here. So either position, rotation, or scale um, of the object using your script. So we're doing transform.translate. Translate means we're changing the position of the object. And then, in this case, we actually don't, it's going to be kind of a vector three, but we don't have to write new vector three because it's not a directly going to a component. So for, because we only want our paddle to be moving up and down. We don't want it to be moving left or right or forward backwards. So for X will just be zero. And then for the Y, we're going to, it will be used um called input dot get access so we're going to get access for one of the three axes either the forward back up and down left or right and in this case we're going to be using the up and down so we'll be using vertical 
which is also for controls as well. And you make sure when you're doing this, you have the parentheses, you have the uh, quotation marks, and then also when you spell it, it's a capital V. I actually ran into this problem when I was actually initially putting this together. I, at the very beginning, actually put a lowercase v in there. And yeah, it didn't work. So then we're gonna take this movement, we're gonna times it by the speed, and then we're gonna times it by what's called time.delta time. And what time.delta time is, is it is, it takes, it's a function of unity that uses um, like your computers or like the whoever's playing the game, it'll use their computers um, like frame rate. So it like understands like, okay, you're operating the game at 10 frames a second. So that basically it's gonna take whatever this is and do only one tenth of that every frame. So in this case of our speed, let's just say our speed is 10 it would take 10 divided by 10 frames a second. So for one, it would only move it one unit every frame so that in one second, it will still only, it will move 10 units. And then like, let's say your computer was operating at 20 frames a second, it would then divide that and would, for that, for that computer would do, uh, what's that math real quick, half a unit every frame so that you would also get after one second, we get 10 frames a second. And it's not as important for games like this, but for games that are like multiplayer, or if you were like making a multiplayer version of this and you were playing like two players playing each other, you'd wanna make sure that both players were operating on the same speed so that the player that had the faster computer doesn't get an advantage based on your game's creation itself. Then we'll make sure we'll put a comma here, and then you'll just do zero F for the, uh, and the Fs in these ones and it in the ball means float. So it's a zero float value for the Z axis, and then close off with the semicolon, and then you'll just do control S to save. You'll go back over real quick, we'll select the paddle, and then we'll drag and drop the script into your window here. And then I'm gonna show you real quick here it's in the project settings under edit, you have it's your input manager. Like right here, it has your horizontal, it has your vertical. For your vertical here, it'll show the buttons like by default, you have your negative button or your down for that and your alternate are either the down arrow keys or the S arrow keys for the WASD. And then for the to move up would be the up arrow or the W key. And you can change that if you want, like if you wanted to use other buttons on your keyboard to move the paddle, you can change that stuff there. Then we'll do control S, and then you can kind of see here and get the really, oh, I, so as you make sure when you do this, we gotta make sure we set the speed on the paddle here. So five, control S, and then we'll go ahead and play. And now we can actually see here, we have the paddle moving and we can kind of, knock the ball back away from the edge here. Does anyone have any questions so far before we go any further? So far, we don't have any questions. I think you've been doing a very good job of walking everybody through the steps so far. Okay, cool. All right, so the next things we're gonna need here is we're actually gonna need to make the UI or like the HUD 
uh, stuff that will be used to keep track of score. So under hierarchy, you will right click, create, or down here under the create thing, you'll use UI and we'll do text. And then when that when you do that, it creates something called a canvas, which is this big thing here. And so I'm just gonna, I just selected canvas, hit the F key to get a better view of all this. And then under text here, I'm actually gonna go over here real quick and name this score. And then what we'll do here is we're gonna move this and you can put this wherever you want on the screen. I just prefer things to be in the corners of the screen so that the player can see as much in here as possible. But if you want to, you can put it right here or you can kind of just pick and choose where you want to put it. And then under here, you'll have your text box here. So you can like write in here. So we'll write score. I'm going to put, I will put the little colon afterwards here so that there's a gap. And then you can select like your color. And for some reason, it always likes to start off as this kind of lightish gray color, but it blends into the background a lot of times. So I always usually will make it like either a dark, like either darken it all the way so it's a little more visible or pick and choose another color that will pop out a little more. Then you can, under font, you can like choose whatever font you want. If you have other fonts saved, normally it's just Arial by default. Then you have the font style, so you can choose normal, which is like the thin lettering here, bold, italic, or bold and italic. I usually, a lot of times, will do the bold just to make it a little thicker so it's a little easier to see. Um, and then you can just choose your font size as well. And then for alignment, like for this, I'm going also, forgot to mention up here, like, yeah, you have your positioning of your text box and you're working in a 2D space. So you're not going to want to have a Z and like have it further or backwards like that. And then you have your size of your text box here. So let's just make that like 100. And I'll just leave that 30. And then down here, you have like your left, right, center alignment. And then you have your up, down, and center alignments here. So you can like center it, make it over to the right hand side here. Then you'll actually do it will be really simply just take that text, control D to duplicate it. And then you'll move another text box over and then you actually, I'm gonna align it to the left here. And right now we'll just fill this with like double zeros, but you can later on, we can, I'll show you how to actually have that as the score that's about to be displayed. That position as such. So now we have the text that will be our score. So now we have our two scripts that are dealing with score. We actually have one that is going to be dealing with displaying the score itself and one that is going to actually like allow us to score the points. And you can combine these into one. Uh, I just have them as separate because like in a full length game, like you might want to actually do a lot more with your scoring. So like the score display is actually kind of more of your score manager thing, which manages both where it's displayed. And like, if you want to like after say like once you've got like 10 points, you wanted to increase the speed of the ball or something you could do that in this script as well. And if we have time here at the end, I'll actually mess with that a little bit and we can, uh, I can show you that real quick. So for the score display, we're also actually gonna need another text box real quick. It's actually going to be created 
on a all right, one second here. Let's control S. Let's see how that looks real quick. All right, so it looks okay, but like, has it kind of blends in because of the shadowing and stuff there? Actually, there's, uh, to make it stand out, we'll do what's just a raw image, which is basically just a little colored block background. And we'll just bring that up. And then you want, if you, like in this case where it's in front of the text here, you can always move it up in your hierarchy, like above it, so it goes behind. And then, like when you're selecting objects, you can hit your R key for scaling. And then you can like squish it down, bring it out a little longer, and then W to bring it in behind it and like later on like when you're finishing up like if you're actually going to publish the game you'd want to clean all this up and make sure that it looks like the sizing and everything is like perfect but for now we're just gonna there and then okay so there now that allows it to kind of pop out against the background a little better so failed is everyone uh is everyone okay so far okay. so far everybody seems to be doing wonderfully oh nice all right so now what we're actually going to do is i'm going to actually just select that same raw image control d to duplicate it I'm actually going to reset this real quick to zero, zero. And then this is going to basically be our game over panel. And then we're going to scale it. You want to have it a little wider. Also, if you're wanting to do your scale, you can do your scale in here. You can also just do, like in this case, height. If you're going to adjust it here, you want to make sure that it's reset to one. And in this case, that's reset to one. So, nope, 250, maybe by, we'll just try 150 for right now. We can always adjust that later on as we see fit. We're gonna actually name this real quick for game over panel. And whenever you're naming objects, a good convention is to always have the first letter of each new word capitalized and then just don't, use any spaces. And then for this, we'll, while we have this selected, you will right click on the object here and then you'll do UI text, which that will make this new text box a parent of the, the image that we have right now. So that way that like right here, if it's like at zero, zero, it's centered in the center of this box. So all the movements, like position numbers, will be relative to the center of the object that it's attached to. And also this way, like let's say like right here, like you can go up here and deselect an object or like you, so it's not like visible in your scene. So like if we turn that off, both that and the object that's the child of the object, of the parent, both of which will disappear now. And that's going to be a little more relevant here in just a moment. So this one will just actually do the zero, zero, left, 18. And again, I want to make sure it's a color that will pop out. And to here so then this will be like right there and then when then if you have that one selected and you duplicate that it will also become a parent or a child of the parent object above it as well so move that off to the side here and we'll just say your score was 
And then we're gonna wanna make that a little wider so all of that shows up here. Uh, let's see. Gotcha. Just set that above that and position that at zero. Let's do that at zero as well. So that we'll just center that underneath it for now. And have it in the center. So now we have like this one and our other score box that where it shows the two spots for the score to be displayed. We can go on about the scoring. So Oh, also, I guess I should. So if you're like in this scene, like right up here like this, and you're trying to maneuver, you hold Alt. And if you um, like hold down the mouse wheel, you can move your scene around. And then you can just use the, the wheel to scroll in and out. And if you hold down Alt and your left click, it uh, will allow you to look around here. So to actually make the scoring displayed, well, I'm gonna have a script here. And the same thing for scripts as well on the naming, like in this case, score display, I capitalize the S and the D. And whenever, like in this case, cause we're gonna be using, uh, we're gonna be manipulating the UI. It's gonna, we're gonna wanna make sure we type in at the top here, using unity engine dot ui with the semicolon to make sure that it's telling the script that we're going to be using or accessing uh ui objects and we're going to be which is like if you're doing images um text or uh like text boxes and all, anything that's under here in unity anything that's under ui here any of this stuff will fall under the if you're move you're editing any of that with the script you need to make sure that you're using or you have that in there so that it can access that correctly then so we're going to have uh, a few different variables here one is a public integer which integer is like a number but it's just a whole number and then score. And this one, it's going to, it's called the public static, which static means you can access that variable from another script. So in the script that we're going to use to actually add to the score, it will call this variable and uh, like add to it. Then we have two, and then we have one that's called public int set score, which means in the inspector, we can set the initial score. And I'll actually show, um, I'll show that here in just a moment. Actually, we're gonna actually have to do something a little different than just saying it straight to zero. Um, public game object and game objects are any object within the game scene itself that we want to uh, reference as a variable type. And we have score box, and then I put GO score box for game over score box. So that's our second one. And then under void start, I have um, score, which is the public, the static one here is set to or equal to the set score. So at the beginning, it will be set to that. So like, let's say we decide we wanted to start off with the scoring at five, it would put that as our set score and then your score would start off at five. Then down here under avoid update, we are going to have, we're gonna uh, access, in this case, the score box, the game object itself, get the component of that object and the component type is gonna be text so we'll get the text component of the text box object and we'll have that in the little, uh, I always just call them point like uh, arrow box or arrow brackets, 
I don't know if there's actually a proper term for that. It's brackets, I always just call them those. And then you have your two closed parentheses for the function. And then we'll do dot text for like the small subcomponent of the bigger text object that we're actually gonna access the actual text script itself. And then we will set it equal to, and you wanna do, you have to do a closed parentheses here to let it know that you're doing what's called a string, which strings are any combination of letters. So like if we wanted to here, instead of making, let me open this up real quick here. Uh, back of here. So like if we wanted to, we didn't actually even have to have two text boxes here. You could have one of them just be the score and actually write in here into your parentheses. Like we could just write score and then that would always pop up and whatever's in here is always going to be the same. This is going to be a static uh, thing that will not change. And then we want to do plus score so that that way it will then include the number from the score uh, variable. And we did the same thing here. And this one's for the other score box for the game over. And then both of which we close off with the brackets or the semicolons. And then after you save it, you minimize it down. Then we're actually going to need to create what's called an empty object here. So you create or right click, create empty. Empty objects are just, oh, one second here. I'm going to name it score manager. Empty objects are. Um, just like something that doesn't display on the screen itself, but allows you to attach a variable to that script or to that object so that it has somewhere to sit while it's running. Like in this case, we're going to drag and drop our score display. All right. So far, I don't see any, see anything in the chat, any questions or anything. Okay. So now once we drag and dropped that onto here, we will have the set score variable here. And then we have these two game objects that says none. So we need to assign those real quick. And then we want to go here and grab score, like the ones that are the actual thing. So I got score parentheses one here that's the one that's got the box and I think it's the uh, the text right there okay so I grab so this one is the one that's up here then we have text and then we'll put those in here so that that way it will track what those objects are and display the scores in those two actual text boxes Then, okay, let's uh, um, you're saying like, The, oh, like moving the camera up and down here. Um, you'll hit Alt and you'll push your uh, middle mouse wheel in, and then you can move your camera up and down. Is that what you're talking about? Okay, cool. Yeah, they move it up and down, and then you can do like that, so you can kind of rotate your uh, view camera. And then for the actual scoring zone itself, we're actually going to need to create what is called a trigger. And that is going to be a 3D object, a cube that is started off at, we'll start off at 0, 0, 0, and then we can move it as we need to. And then for the scale, we're going to do the, 
like about 10, more than that. Uh, so probably think about 20, we'll just do 22 because we can always move it off to the side here a little bit. Then for that, or for the Y direction, we do it as, let's do it as 11. So, whoop, not, not 111. Then um, for the Z, we'll do one and a half. And we'll move that over just a bit. So it's kind of, so it's just, there's a gap here between the edge of your paddle and where the scoring is itself. And I'm going to call this score trigger. And then if we're going to do anything as a trigger, you got to make sure that the under your box collider here, it is trigger is checked. So that, that way it is a trigger. And then you can always go over here next to mesh render and you can turn the mesh render off. So that way it'll, it's still in the scene, but that way you're not seeing it like while you're playing. And the live triggers, this is what they are. They don't, you will not actually see the trigger zone itself. And next to the score or next to the name of your object in the inspector window, you have this little like 3D cube with a little arrow under it. And you can click on that arrow and you can select like any of these things here at the top like any of the colors you want, I'll do as blue. And that way, so like the object itself is not there, so you can't select the object. If you click right here, it's not allowing you to select it, but the name of the object and where it's at, like the central location, is now showing on the screen here so that you can just click in this case, like score trigger, and it pops up the score trigger here. Then we'll create a script here called scoring. And we'll open that up here real quick. And it's going to be very simple. We're actually not going to use the other two default functions here. We're going to do what's called in void on trigger enter. And you can actually, you don't have to have it say private by default, usually it will um, default to private. And this simply means that when the object, in this case, the ball enters this trigger, it will do whatever it's scripted to do. So in this case, we're gonna do score display, which is the script that we used earlier, dot score, that's the variable that we want to edit. And we will do plus plus, which is added to that. And then you do the semicolon. We'll save that. And then we'll just do where it says scoring right here. Then like, and then this is right here where I'll show you with the thing. So by default, right? Like it's now has your score at one because it's already entered at the beginning. So for we'll go back to our score manager, we'll have to set that to default of negative one so that when it enters at the very beginning, it's entering the thing technically because it's already there. Um, it will default it. It will add one. So then that puts your score at zero on start. Okay, my time time to actually get a little further than I thought it was. So what we'll actually do here is we'll actually just take the score trigger and uh, duplicate that and we'll change this to game over and we'll just make this a little thinner here. It's down to two and we'll make it to like 13 so that make sure that if the ball leaves and at some weird angle, it always catches the trigger. And we'll move this right over to the end here. 
so that that way when the ball leaves here, this will trigger the game over. And we'll go to the scoring script here and you'll just right click on hit remove component. And then we'll put our game over script here, which so we'll just create a new script for game over. And game over, we will just simply use public game object panel, which is going to be our game over panel, the one we just kind of created that had the other where the other score was at in the center of our screen. And then you'll do the semicolon and afterwards or down here in void start, we'll do panel, the name of the object, and it's called set active. So this way we can set whether or not it's visible in the scene or not. And then in parentheses, you'll type with a lowercase f, uh, you'll type false, semicolon. And then that way, at the beginning of the level, it will not be shown. And then we'll do another on trigger uh, enter. And then we'll do panel set active true with a lowercase t. And then that way it is, um, it turns on the game over trigger when we get to the thing here. So then we'll hit save, do that. So now this way, oh, then when we actually have the panel here, we actually have to put the game over panel assign that here to the object so that panel that we've been seeing like that's been in our center of our screen now you'll see it's not there and which i'll just let the ball go out and now as you can see as the ball leaves the panel pops up that the game is over and that is where you would have your buttons and all that and actually with time constraints here i'm not actually going to be able to I think I can just fit that in here real quick. Sorry for going fast here, guys. It's uh, trying to get a little bit more done than I thought I'd have a little more time. So then we'll do under UI button to create a button. And because they're the same color, like here under the panel itself, we'll just create, we'll change the color. I'm just going to do it as a blue background. Then the button, you have two components. You have the button itself, which is the, the image. And then you have the text component of the button. So we'll put the button, to put one down here. And we'll do the width of that 125. And then under the text here is where you would modify all the text. Like in this case, I'll just do replay. Then we can duplicate that button, bring it up here, and then go under that text here. And we'll just we'll just type real quick main menu. And then for a button, like if you're using buttons. You have to, like for the script for it here, because we're going to be using that to either restart the scene or go to another scene. And you'll use this for the main menu as well. You'll have to do Unity or using Unity Engine dot scene management. So that, that way it knows that you're going to be using these uh, commands to send it to another scene. And then you're actually not going to uh, need any of the other functions so you can just delete all those out and then it's actually public void in this case and you can name it whatever you want like I named it play game for like when you hit play at the main menu and then you have to do these little parentheses which means you're creating a function and then these open and close curly brackets which means what you are saying what you want to do within that function and then you'll type scene manager dot load scene and then you'll type the number that the scene is and i'll show you here in just a moment where you get that uh where you get the numbers from so in this case we're going to load the first scene for that and then 
for the, and then I did the public void main menu, and then that's zero. For the same scene manager. And how you do the scenes here is when you go back to here, you'll do file build settings. And then you'll want to make sure, like, when you create your main menu screen, and you just, uh, like, you would have that scene open. Hit add open scene. So, like, in this case, that would be that one. Like, if I was to add this scene right here, that would be scene two. And I can create another function here real quick to show you how to use that. So that would be, in this case, that's number two, but wherever that is for you on your current project, so I'll do public void, we'll just call it level one. Or, and then with that scene manager load scene two quickly here and then you'll have to create another empty object here on your uh, sidebar and I'm just going to call that button button manager then I will take my button options script real quick over here and then on these individual buttons themselves like in this case for replay, we're going to want, you'll go down to the bottom of where the button is. And it will say like list is empty. Like this, like on click. So that's like when you click the button, like what happens, you'll hit the little arrow here for add to list. And then you'll take the button manager game object. And you'll bring it down here so that that way the script now attaches to this. And then you'll select the uh, function you want. So you'll go under whatever your script name is here. And in this case, I have that function is level one. So that way I do that. And then for main menu, I'll create that. I'll do button manager, button options, and main menu. So that way, like it fails here, I can just hit replay and then it starts back over again. Or I can hit main menu and it goes back to my main menu. All right, so that's the gist on how to create a quick and easy single player uh, Pong clone. Um, got 20 minutes left here. Uh, does anyone have any questions about either this or game design in general that they want to ask? Still don't have any questions in the queue at the moment. Okay. Um, real quick here, I'm actually going to Yes, it's being recorded. Um, I think Q said it's going to be put up on the River Speaks website, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it should be up sometime within the next two weeks. And we did just get one question. Uh, what are some things you see a lot with young, inexperienced game designers? Uh, the biggest thing that uh, I see a lot with young, inexperienced game designers, and I even actually experienced this myself, is... Uh, simply that you make your scope of your project too big. Uh, when I was actually in college, um, like our first game design semester, we were told, okay, here's going to be, here's the program we're using. Like we had already had a little bit of like modeling class experience and all that. And we had done basic programming for like programming apps and all that. But he was teaching us just how to use Unity and saying, all right, what type of a game do you want to make? And pretty much every single person in that chat or in our class, like when we pitched our games, all of us wanted to make like these big open world games like World of Warcraft or Skyrim, uh, not Skyrim, what was, 
Elder Scrolls Oblivion was the one that was out at that time, or Fallout, or big projects like that. And our teacher was that type of teacher who he'd let you learn from your own mistakes. So he never, um, so he wouldn't like, um, like tell us like, oh, that's way too big of a project. You're not gonna be able to get that done in 12 weeks. His thing was, okay, if you think you can do it, go ahead. And pretty much all of us tried to do that. And none of us even got like a full level completed. Like all of us quickly realized like, we would get like a character, maybe you would have like a door opening or you could walk up and click on, um, like you'd be able to click on something like that gives you like a quest or something, but we never, none of us got combat done. None of us got pretty much anywhere near what we thought we'd be able to accomplish. So usually I would just say the biggest mistake is you aim too big. So the first thing I would say is just figure out what you want to do. Like there's a term minimal viable product. Like what is the core idea of that game and make a very small demo that gets it up and running. And actually, so there's another question here on average, how long do you think it takes to make a complex game? Um, or, Um, like, are you asking about like for like one person by themselves, or are you talking about like a like the AAA titles, like the big studios? I can get that clarification real quick. Uh, uh, both. Okay, so. For like indie development titles, usually, actually both of which, I guess it kind of can be really open-ended. Like I've seen people like individual teams, like small teams do like small games in a few weeks. And actually there's these things called game jams where you literally sometimes are creating a small, a very small game with by yourself or in a team of maybe up to five people in uh, 72 hours. But like a lot of times the AAA titles that you see um, usually take at least a year. Like we'll usually see like for the Madden games, they see like every year, but they're reusing a lot of assets from year to year. Um, but like even games like Call of Duty where they're releasing one every year, they have two different studios working on it. So each studio is taking roughly two years to make that particular title that you're seeing. And sometimes they even take longer, like some of these different ones, like World of Warcraft um, took a few years for the first one, and then they take about a year or so just to make every DLC, which is usually only a small chunk of what the original level is. Um, I've actually got a few links that I was going to put in chat here. Is that, am I allowed to do that? I... Uh, Matthew? Uh, yes. Oh, I was just wondering, is it okay if I put links in chat? Absolutely. Okay, cool. Should I get permission here? Okay, so I'm going to put... So the first one here, this is actually to a YouTube playlist from a group called Extra Credit. They actually have a whole playlist on making your first small game, like for indie developers or for small teams, and it actually has... One episode is all about the scope of like how to make sure your game is not too big of a project. And it also goes over all the other kind of do's and don'ts for making your first game. And then the other one here is actually from a guy and he actually has a, a bunch of things on his channel. This is just some of the stuff that he like one of the ones about making your first game. Um, he runs a group called Game Dev Underground that has a YouTube channel that pushes out con or puts out content uh, on game development. And he also is an indie game developer himself. And he really want he works with like the community to his thing is help the gaming community build, make better and build, make, build and publish better games. 
and he's got a lot of great content on there. He also has a Discord if you have that. I'm actually in his Discord um, community, and it like connects. So like if you're a programmer and you need somebody who's an artist, he's got like places in there for you to meet people of other skills. And help like get people like if you need contract work and all that. Yeah, it, it takes a lot of and things out there. And actually, there's a, another YouTube series. I don't have the link for it, but if you just like uh, go on YouTube and it's for the Halo development for Halo Five, um, it's called the Sprint. Um, and it actually, they take you behind the scenes of like what it takes to make all the stuff for um, Halo 5 Guardians, which is really insightful if you're really into that. And also it shows some about the program and it shows about the testing, the different designers, and it takes you behind the scenes and really shows you a lot of the different elements that go into it. If I can real quickly here. Grab a link to that real quick. All right. Well, Andrew's looking for that. It looks like we're reaching the end of our time. So if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can ask them now. I'm dropping a link to uh, the evaluation form for this sessions and for all the sessions. Um, I'm also dropping the link to our next session at one o'clock. Um, but it looks like we got a question um, <clears throat> from an anomaly speaks. They're asking, um, "What got you interested in game design in the first place, Andrew?" Um, growing up, actually, I was my dad was a um, IT professional for um, for TI and Healer Packard was his companies he was working for at the time. Um, so he was all like he was involved really early on with like the early day computers and all that. So we had computers growing up. And so I grew up playing like centipede. Actually, my first ever game was actually, I used to play with my mom was uh, Oregon Trail and the Mist uh, and Riven series of games. And then there was a show on TV um, for G4 TV. There was a game uh, there was like a behind the scenes uh, game maker thing, and they they took the guy who made um, the original Prince of Persia, and then the next episode I saw was the Final Fantasy, like for how they made the first one, and just seeing those episodes and seeing like what all they were doing to make these games and like how like it, they were made just those shows in general and playing the games themselves fascinated me to be like, Oh man, I really want to kind of get in, into that. And then when it was leaving high school, going towards college, I was like, my parents wanted me to go and get a degree of some kind. And I wasn't really interested in any of the traditional degrees that like out there, like English or uh, business or any of those kind of things. So I went on the game art track I will say, though, I did take a couple marketing classes and other business classes. Those are very helpful if you are not. If you're somebody who is thinking about doing like indie and all that, knowing how to market and finance and all that kind of stuff is really important. because You need to be able to keep track of your information or keep track of your finances and just know how to get because if or to market because if you don't market your games, Nobody knows about them, so you will never sell anything, or you won't sell very many. And that echoes what we heard in Rob's talk, right? You know, you can be the best gamer out there, but if nobody knows who you are and you're not putting out content, then nobody's going <laughs> to pay attention. We also had a question come in from Claudio Rodriguez saying, I was wondering what kind of computer you were using and if there's any that you recommend, since I know it's important to have a nice running system to design games. Um. Actually, my computer is actually kind of just a kind of a mix of parts right now because I've actually been getting hand-me-down parts from my brother, who's like a really big IT person. And 
at the current moment, the graphics cards that they just came out with are also being used um, in the PS5 and the new Xbox consoles. So they are really hard to get your hands on. Um, honestly, depending on what kind of games you're making, um, like depending on what uh, stuff you're working on, like you can honestly develop even on really low end systems. Uh, my brother and I are actually working on a game right now, like a little platformer game. That's um, he's actually been doing. Like when he comes over to to my house here, he's um, coming over. He doesn't bring like his regular computer. He just brings his little uh, Microsoft Surface tablet, and he can do all the stuff on there and run it just fine. Um, what are some game projects I'm really proud of? Um, one of the ones I'm really proud of was actually probably my second one when I was in college. Um, like my friend and I, we actually made this game. It was like a little home defender. So it was kind of a take on Call of Duty Zombies. But we just had like you had your little home. You're defending it from aliens that were attacking. Uh, there's that one. Uh, I've worked on several projects like throughout game jams and all that. Um, one of which was like an endless runner. I've done another, some different platformers of different kinds. Uh, I don't have anything that's actually published right now. So I and actually I'm working on that hopefully this year. Fingers crossed. Can actually bring myself to finish a project, and which is an important thing. Nobody knows about it if you don't ever finish it. Uh, kind of don't, which is I kind of got caught up in that cycle of shiny object syndrome. I'm always jumping from one new project to another. So, I'm actually kind of um, latter part of last year, even just kind of sat down, was like, all right find a couple of the projects I've been working on and one of the ones is with the one with my brother we're working on the little platformer and we're working on a fighting game as well and we're going to try to push to get those finished up this year or sometime here in the near future and get those published um, I put in the thing like under River Speaks there it has this book um, but, and then the other one, it's called, try to get my camera to focus on it, Scott Rogers Level Up. It's a, like an intro, like a uh, guide to game design, and it has a bunch of really good information in there, um, especially because I'll be taking breaks here and there from game design. Every time I come back, I usually end up sitting down and reading this book or chapters of the book. Because there's a lot of good fundamentals in there that are good information. 